Welcome back to A People's Guide to Publishing. I'm Joe Beal, the founder and CEO of Microcosm Publishing and Distribution. I'm also the author of A People's Guide to Publishing, which distills what I've learned from selling millions of books over the past 25 years. I'm Ellie Blue. I'm the editorial and marketing director here at Microcosm. We are an independent midlist publisher based in Portland, Oregon and Cleveland, Ohio. We have over 700 books, over 25 employees, and we make about 40 new books every year. And we distribute thousands of titles from other publishers. We started this podcast so that we can share what we've learned with newer publishers so that you can learn from our mistakes. Or maybe you just want to understand the publishing industry. We're going to look at where submissions come from and why and what makes something a good fit and how we really know what's going to happen before it happens and that's the like simplest way of putting it and um, this is usually the part where people are like but how do you really know and you kind of really know every publisher's job first and foremost is to make content more valuable like more valuable than if before you were involved or if you didn't exist And this usually sounds obvious or reductive, but it's the honest truth. And so at the like most basic level, the publisher's role is to identify what content they have, the acumen, the reputation, the skill set, and the relationships that allow it to make the work more valuable than it is sitting on somebody's shelf or hard drive. And so from there, every task that a publisher does is an extension of this objective. This is like, and that really should be how it operates where you're like, you know, looking at it that way. Of course, valuable doesn't just mean like in capitalistic terms, it should mean in terms of like finding the book's audience, like the lives that it can touch, the ways that it can change conversations about culture and the topic of the book. Um, conveniently, this is achieved most easily through the value chain of the work finding its audience through existing networks. So this is a rare moment, you know, where the value chain is mostly aligned. Everybody benefits at the same time, as opposed to other times where you're like sort of fighting in opposition, you know, like everybody's interests are really benefited. The publisher wants the book to continually achieve turn times. You know, the store wants books that appeal to its customers' interests, and the author wants people to read their book and, you know, maybe get paid too. And the best and easiest way is to acquire books that sell well alongside the publisher's existing catalog. This makes it easier to approach stores that you have existing relationships with about a new title. It requires less exposition. The store understands your reputation. They know your point of view. They understand how a new title probably benefits the reader. There's less confusion and stores know how to sell new books as well as what to expect and what to find inside, you know? And that's the short of it. It's like they'll have emotional associations and that they're coming to it with, you know, and that's, so you want to, make those work for you rather than work against you. It's like when you do something that's like really outside of that, it tends to flop just about every single time because they're like having a hard time wrapping their head around it. So for newer publishers, you have to start out small and see what sticks, you know, what are readers responsive to? And this can be really initially surprising. So when we published Making Stuff and Doing Things, uh, which was our first hit for those of you that are not familiar. It was originally a two volume set called How To, which is kind of a clunky title. And that was in 1997. Um, We inherited the project when another publisher uh, went belly up, Tree of Knowledge. And um, we inherited the most labor intensive manner that this uh, was to be produced. And It didn't sell really well at first because it was always out of stock because we were constantly having to make them. And so we knew that we needed to streamline that process. So we put them together into one volume and we called it Making Stuff and Doing Things. And then we had a big argument with the author about what the cover needed to look like. And um, but ultimately, like we we did really well because it sold the first printing of 3000 in three weeks. And that was before we really had any of the mechanisms we have now. But, you know, we didn't know when we took on that book 
that it would go on to sell over 60,000 copies more than 25 years later. But, and really, the early success of that book was fundamental to our publishing program. And that's really how we learned a lot of those lessons. And so we developed adjacent titles that sell well alongside making stuff and doing things. And that's been foundational to the strength of our publishing program. And whenever we've gone too far astray from something that's adjacent to that, those tend to be the books that struggle. So, you know, we it's like incremental steps outward is a good way to think about it. And having a clear editorial vision on top of what we already know, you know, to be true has remained our guiding principle, you know? So like sometimes, you know, a book would be really popular, but it's also really not for us. So we work in communities that we are active participants in and contributors to so that our role and our motives aren't questioned. You know, people trust us because they know us, you know? So we make slow and adjacent steps as we gain credibility in neighboring fields. You know, and if you go too fast, people are like, huh, what are you doing? And so how should a publisher find these books where they have requisite acumen, reputation, skill set, and relationships to make these books more valuable? Well, again, the easiest and best way is through the point of view of their existing catalog. And point of view is like not something that publishers think about a lot, but it like really should exist and you really need to have it. So because authors usually find a publisher through buying one of their books, you know, they appreciate aspects about that book and then they conceive a fantasy in their mind where you publish their book as well. And that <laughs> tends to be what actually happens. Most, you know, we can't publish all of those books, but we get like one or two pitches a day where authors are like, I read Unfuck Your Brain. And so I'm pitching you my book that is basically the same book. And, you know, and we're like, well, that doesn't really work. But if you have something that is more yourself, we would take a look at that. So, um, of course, authors don't really understand the acumen, skill set, relationships, and reputation part. They typically think of all publishers being the same or interchangeable. So, like, I'm frequently met with the, I bet the first 30 publishers that rejected Harry Potter feel pretty dumb. But the reality is that those weren't the right publisher for that book. And, you know, it wouldn't have necessarily found its audience and it definitely wouldn't have found its audience in the same way because not all publishers are the same. And that's really difficult for authors to understand. So we frequently receive pitches that are like everything from Christian poetry to like gruesome true crime to moralizing children's books to fantasy novels to technical books about the latchkey system. An actual book we received a pitch for this past month and we get so many memoirs about teaching under COVID and what that's like. And, and well, every one of those books, except the last one, there's nothing wrong with those books, but nobody wants to read yet another memoir about what it's like to teach under COVID. The rest, there's nothing wrong with them, but they aren't gonna find their readers or retailers through Microcosm because that's not what people come to Microcosm for. So when we publish books outside of our lane, they fail to find their readers and they become less valuable through being published instead of more valuable. So we're actually doing a disservice to those authors and those books because we've eliminated their chance in the world. You know, a book doesn't get published, fail, and then get republished somewhere else because the first thing that the next publisher does is looks at the track record of that author and they're like, wow, that one sucked. We're not gonna ever try that again, you know? And so, this is typically why like being in print is a bad thing unless you're having success out of the gate. So we know through expertise and experience what will and will not find a better audience elsewhere. And usually that's a difficult conversation to have with the author. So we receive about three submissions per day, typically um, about a thousand per year. But my stock response to 95% of these pitches is exactly the same because it's like always the same problem. So what I typically say is some very slight variation of, thanks for getting in touch and thinking of microcosm. Your submission sounds great and you have a lot of expertise to offer. However, we really wanna be the best choice for authors when we are taking on their book and that's really not the case here. 
We are too much of a general interest trade nonfiction publisher, so you'd be better off with the publisher who specializes in your genre and who offers books in this vein with readers who devour this kind of work because they are more specialized in your field and known for work like yours. Unfortunately, due to being an adult trade nonfiction publisher, we have no relationships or credibility in your genre and thus don't have the ability to make books like yours find their readers or perform their objectives. Every single book in your genre that we have attempted has been a miserable failure that did not recoup its costs. So unfortunately, us taking on your book isn't to your benefit because it only serves to hold down our warehouse floor. This isn't due to any deficiencies with your book. It has more to do with our specializations and reputation. Your requested feedback, because we only send this if they request feedback, is to visit your local bookstores, see who is selling similar books, both to see how it's shelved, what it's next to, and how it's presented, as well as what is most popular. If you don't buy something, which, you know, come on, it's a bookstore, leave with a firm sense of what catches your attention and appeals to you and why. How are people developing work in your genre? The key is to forming an emotional connection similar to the other books on your shelf, which is performed through telling the reader what the book is about in the cover and the development. Once you've got this workshopped, I'd make a list of these publishers who are putting out successful work on your shelf and follow their submission guidelines. 950 of these a year, because people just really, really think that like they found us, we're a publisher, and then they try to like twist and distort their pitch to make it fit for us. But that's like the bane of like being able to read between the lines is that you're like, not another teaching under COVID memoir, please and thank you. Not another book that is identical to unfuck your brain, you know, please and thank you. And so, you know, it's a little intentionally dramatic, but that's to make a point because it's usually not their book that's the problem. It's that publishers aren't interchangeable. You know, we're not ATM machines with book distribution so much as like we're kind of like individual taste making brands with our own personalities, relationships and skills. So authors usually feel shut out and believe that publishers don't know what we're doing. So it's also important to offer a path forward. We had one author attempt to sneak past the front counter and climb over the barrier to get a private audience with me in my office, apparently believing that it would be easier to sway me in person, though I was in a meeting at the time. If an author follows the process and is open to feedback and development, I think it's easier to get published than most people think, to be honest. You know, you just have to like actually listen and understand as much as you talk. You know, that's like kind of the other trouble of the matter. But so of these 1,000 submissions a year, we publish about 40 or 2.5%. This is up from about 1% five years ago, believe it or not. So how did we become more than twice as efficient? It's because we revised our submission process and we stopped having backdoor conversations. The assumption is usually that maintaining an open door and handholding results in more books seeing their way through the process. But years of attempting this it actually turned out to be the opposite. When we were open to meet and talk with authors in submission, fewer of their books were published. In one example, an author approached an employee at an event, had an extensive backdoor conversation, and believed that they had greenlit permission for us to publish their book. They learned what to say to get accepted, what our hesitations are, and how, to, how we think. So two years after the book was acquired, which we did acquire the book, we canceled it based on the contents that they knew were objectionable to us in the first place, but they thought that we'd look the other way if the issue came up so late in the process. So we had to change our policy not to announce until after development now, because if development is finished, then we won't announce and cancel anymore. So, and it's really because of authors like this where they were trying to like work their way around the system. So in a contrasting example, we receive, you know, website submissions every week, you know, 20, 25 or so. Um, and we received one in the past week. The pitch was substantive. It was well-developed. It was thought through. Um, I requested the manuscript the next day. They sent it a few hours later. It was well edited. It read well, even though it's like not a genre that I personally read or like am invested in. I still enjoyed it. So I sent them a contract. They asked some clarifying questions, and we had a publishing agreement within one week after they submitted. This is because they followed the instructions, prepared for a successful outcome, and planned ahead. They were ready when I asked for it, and it worked because of that. 
so we used to propose projects to authors that we saw merit in, but those projects almost never happen. So we can propose new books to authors that we want to work with already sometimes, or I'm sorry, that we do already work with sometimes. But when we approach new authors cold with project ideas, this has resulted in exactly zero successful books in 27 years. So that's, you know, if we have a relationship, it's a little bit different when, so we really want the authors to approach us rather than us approaching the authors in most cases. So, and that's another reason why we say what we're interested in, and then we wait for them to come to us rather than cold calling, essentially. So similarly, going outside of what we know to be best practices has also yielded zero successes. We stopped chasing projects that were never going to happen. Now we wait for those authors to come back to us when they are ready, because that tends to be the, you know, the way that works out. So instead, we created incredibly clear submission guidelines and posted them publicly on our website. This makes our own platform the authority and we update it regularly based on feedback. We clarify what we do and don't want. We say what we prioritize and what we are what we are not interested in. We don't pay for external services or submission management tools because it just results in greater volumes of submissions we aren't gonna publish anyway because we don't need more submissions, we need better submissions. And so by curating the funnel a little tighter that results whereas you know when you pay for a service like submittable or something you're just really saying like hey we exist and then you're having to like sift through more crap which who wants to sift through more crap and so our submission guidelines are in fact highly praised and imitated by others throughout the industry which like i was really flattered by because like i feel like that is the piece of writing i have done the most revisions to in my life and um, because the submission guidelines do the heavy lifting of both bringing in the right people and turning away the wrong people before they submit, which is really the point, you know, so then like everybody saves time. So we ask for four things. The author identifies three similar titles that we have recently published we, that we want a five second description of the book, including its practical and emotional payoffs that make it distinct from other books on the same shelf. And part of the ask here is that if the person is a writer, they should be able to write one really good sentence that is compelling and substantially offers this information. And you would not believe how much hollow and meaningless language people try to cram into the longest paragraph that they believe can be read in five seconds in your life. So. The third thing is an explanation of why they want to publish this book and their lived expertise and experience, because those are kind of two things that go hand in hand with like understanding. If they say like, I just want to make money, then like they're probably not going to be great to work with. You know, like it's okay to want to make money and be compensated, but that like shouldn't be a primary motive. Like they should really want to impact and change culture. Like that's a way more notable and noble what reason to publish a book i i believe and you know to some degree it's like you know you want to like be part of the conversation on your topic um and then we ask for the first paragraph from each chapter of the book you know so then that's just like to see if the book is actually like if they have the skills to actually write the book and if the book actually says something and if you know it's like secretly a memoir about what it's like to teach under COVID, but they're pitching it as like the universal experience of how the author's life could be better. Believe it or not, that happens every single week. So we found that all of this information that we need to review a submission takes about 30 seconds of, of our time, you know? So we work very hard to keep an open door and we put up as few barriers as possible to submitting so that people don't need an agency selling their work or they don't need to spend hours crafting a proposal. They need, you know, they just really need to understand their own work. And then everything that we ask for, even if we don't take their book, it would help them wherever they would pitch it to that would take it. So it's trying to think of it that way too, where it's like, what's an efficient use of their time and like to reframe their thinking. 
So we also offer feedback to anybody who wants it for free. But again, 95% of that is, you know, the same four paragraphs. But there are limits to this, and we learned a lot through experimentation. So, you know, we're not going to consult with them endlessly. And most people, when you recommend publishers to them, they're like, okay, yeah, now just tell me the contact phone numbers for all of the editors at those publishers. And we're like, you have to do your own homework, but this is this is the freebie. We don't, you know, we don't work for you. We're like trying to help you out here. So we found that through creating the reality or appearance that befriending us improves somebody's chances of being published. And that is actually like one of the most dangerous things in publishing because for a lot of people, that kind of networking has what made it an insider's game rather than something based on merit or the merit of the work, you know? So it became more a game of who you know rather than a game of like what you have to offer of significance. So doing so creates the exclusive world of gatekeeping that everyone complains so much about. But um, so we're really trying to turn that on its head too because then you don't also have the problem of like having emotional attachment to the author or the book that like you can't actually sell, which is sort of the bottom line, I feel like. Um, we found that the best practices for incorporating diverse voices was making it clear in both our submission guidelines and in our publishing program that this is what we're interested in. And this is like all kinds of things, you know? So this is, you know, I mean, to me, I feel like if you sat through a pitch presentation of HarperCollins publishers, you would hear so many memoirs of retirees who live in Man Midtown Manhattan and like worked 40 years in a law firm. And you have to swear that the only reason that HarperCollins is publishing their book is because their agent or they themselves lives next door to somebody that works at HarperCollins and they're in the network because there's no reason for so many of those books to exist in the first place. So, you know, you're trying to get outside of that and solve that problem by like making books that are actually interesting. And so forcing someone to do social relational labor to get special treatment was also sort of an undue burden that never really resulted in publishing their books. Our books in print and word of mouth about us are much more powerful drivers for sending the right authors to us. And I mean, and it's working a lot better also. So one of the most difficult things to understand is that if someone approaches you and asks about submitting, the best thing to say is, fantastic, we take submissions through our website. All the information is on there. And then, you know, naturally, in a moment of like, you know, they're, they're self-interested here, so, you know, bear that in mind. They will usually respond to that by pitching their submission to you on site. And then if you respond with anything other than, wow, sounds great, submit that through our website, you're reducing the chances that we will publish this book because anything else they will interpret as your buy-in or enthusiasm or like they've got you on the hook. And again, why is this? If you express too much interest or intermediate yourself into the process, it ambiguates their next steps. They feel like there's the process is suddenly more complicated. This person will feel like they have a connection with you and contact you instead of submitting through the proper channels. Any amount of time that you spend with them, they will interpret as microcosms, interest and investment in their project. They will think that continuing to contact you is a better backdoor than contacting through the proper channels. If you meet with someone about their submission, they will interpret this as microcosm finding value in their project. For this reason, the best thing to do is always direct them back to the submissions on the website. And like, I know it doesn't, it sounds counterintuitive, but over and over and over, every single time, even when they slip through, it's like, those are not the ones that like, we, we have to kill them in post so many times. The other reason for this is that the submission process is the first evaluation of working together. If someone asks questions answered thoroughly on our website or requires a sit down meeting before we have agreed to work together, it's revealing of what it will be like to work with them long term. So how the submission process, how the submission process goes usually shows how pushy they are and how willing they are to see this as a collaborative partnership, read instructions, follow directions, trust the process, you know, things like that. So it's like sort of the first experience of working together. 
It shows their ability to think critically and to do research and understand what makes their book special versus like just be pushy all the time and tell you that you don't understand because we've really seen both. And, you know, sometimes like somebody will sit down and listen to you, but it really comes down to the point of how much time and effort goes into reframing it for them to listen to you versus them thinking that you don't understand and then that's the actual problem. So it's abundantly clear when someone claims that their work is the most special thing we'll ever see, but their submission does not demonstrate this, that they are a bad fit because they didn't put in the time. In 90% of cases, the submission process, you know, is the greatest reveal of what it will be like. Um, in 10% of cases, we have to request a complete sample of the submission. And then, you know, obviously that takes more than 30 seconds. But in most cases, that's like, under five minutes, you know, in half of these cases, the author never actually sends the requested sample. And that's like 50 manuscripts per year that don't even have their chance. So, and you have to wonder if they like didn't exist yet, or the author got cold feet or like what's going on there exactly. We may never know, but that's fine. Um, and the biggest problems that submission with submissions that we receive are really the same things over and over again also. The submission falls too far outside of our genre's reputation and skills. Publishing it would essentially require the formation of another company, would have to research every aspect of how to publish this genre and develop credibility and marketing within it, would have to learn best practices from scratch, and the first 10 books would probably still flop because we'd be botching the development as we were learning. So that's a really expensive set of mistakes that are best avoided. Um, there's really no audience for the book. That also does happen. Um, my joke one is the My Opinions by Me, which is a book that is published to us several times per month. Um, it's developed from what the author wants to write rather than what anyone wants to read. Nobody wants to have somebody tell them that they're wrong about everything, especially if that person lacks credentials and or having done research in a lot of cases. So um, I usually have to ask the leading question, what would motivate a reader to spend their time and money on this book instead of the tens of millions of other books in print? And, you know, that's not usually how the author is thinking about their work, but that is how the reader is thinking about their work. Um, the submission doesn't contain a value proposition. It doesn't say anything new or it doesn't occupy a niche. So uh, the work isn't significantly distinct from the books in print. So it would essentially flop upon arrival. Uh, real submission examples of this include DIY environmentalism, which I'm not entirely sure what that would be. Organic smoothie recipes, which there's just like hundreds and hundreds of books like that, if not thousands at this time. How I have all of the answers to overhauling the US educational system. That is a book that we have received, uh, I don't know, two to three times per year since um, we took website submissions. So there's a, everybody has the answers, but nobody kind of wants to hear those answers. Or like it's kind of the question, there's like a subgenre of that where I have all the answers, but it's not something that the public can fix you know, where it's like part of society that's so fundamentally broken that it's not like voted on, you know? So you can have all the answers, but it can kind of be like a philosophical exercise in understanding that. Um, there's a value in summarizing all the existing thought on a subject into a single volume, especially if it's work that was published across decades and a lot of the books are out of print or in cases where the shelf is really thin. But in most cases, the author needs a sharp point of view and an original perspective to write something meaningful. So that means like, what is their take on all this stuff? Why, like, what sort of through line are they putting through the work? You know, so it's not just like, here's what this book says and here's what this book says. And I don't really agree with either of them. It needs to be more like the, point of view needs to be driving from the beginning to the end. Uh, the author believes that the rules of science simply do not apply to them. Uh, that's freakishly common. 
my favorite is there has never been anything like this before which is false in 99.9% .9 of cases and the rest of the time there's a very good reason for it so um i have i have read there was one where the um they had gotten a blurb that said this is the weirdest book i've ever read but you're like it's not that that's doing it any favors <laughs> so it's more like that might be its detriment so, but usually again, this just means that the author is woefully unfamiliar with what is in print or like what makes somebody buy books. Cause you know, there's lots of books to buy. The shelf in question is simply too crowded. So we had to stop publishing memoirs because the number published per year began outnumbering novels. And that was a little bit shocking because it seems like everybody wants to write a novel, but truly everybody wants to write a memoir apparently. Uh, and the shelves are simply too competitive because in order to succeed, every book has to displace another book for a sustained period of time without being displaced itself. So you have to like knock a book off and not be knocked off. And this is the reason that like we had to move away from fiction too, because it's just the same way where it's like people just pump so much money into it that you can't compete with that. And if you could, you wouldn't want to because it's also like, how do you possibly win? It's so expensive. And um, next problem is the author lacks credibility. For some subjects, readers prioritize, prioritize credentials over value proposition. Uh, this is true in academic publishing and in any field that's accredited like therapy or medicine. So how does the reader know that the author is an expert and understands the field adequately if they lack the requisite credentials? In other cases, work that the author has done in the past describes the disproven theories or ideas that were discredited. So it's like pretty tough to trust them now. If an author was in the news for making racist statements, you wouldn't trust them to write a book on anti-racism without a fundamental turnaround in their point of view. Sometimes you just wouldn't trust them to write another book on any subject because it's simply difficult to believe anything that they would say is earnest or honest. And that's the difficult thing in a lot of cases where you know, we're getting pitches and you're like, why would anybody trust you to be the authority on this? And, you know, not necessarily because of something they said or did, but because they don't really seem to have like well-formed thoughts or they haven't like done their own research yet, it would seem. Uh, the author doesn't yet have the ability to write the book that they envision. This is the least common problem, but it is occasionally a problem. The author is more of an expert and a visionary than a writer and doesn't have the ability to land the plane. They typically write flowery yet very unclear sentences that don't quite express what they think they do. So for us to take on projects like this, it has to be a really, really vacant shelf because like, we have to essentially know that we'll put in a ton of work and so we have to know that the book will sell, you know, 5,000 plus minimum. So it does happen. Um, so each book that we publish costs us $20,000 to $50,000, which feels completely ludicrous, but is the closest thing to hard numbers. So making too many mistakes in a single year could be the end of us, you know? And as a result, we really look at the intersection of three variables in each submission. How much demand is there for the topic? How much supply is there on the topic? You know, like where those two sort of intersect. Is the book sufficiently distinct from the other books on the shelf? Or is the shelf simply so thin that any book added to it would be successful? Conversely, all the books on that shelf are so bad that it would be easy to publish a shelf busting title. And, you know, so like examples of those would be like the autism books, because there's just not a lot of books in that way that aren't technical or academic books or books for counselors, et cetera. So that's like, a, that's an easy one. And then, you know, if you're a fan of a subject, you know where all the books are bad and there's room for another book, you know, that's, and you can kind of tell by looking at something, but for, in a lot of, you know, there are cases where I need to go to the bookstore and be like, is what the author says true? Is there actually not a book about that? And, you know, this was the case when we published Sex from Scratch in 2013, where the author was like, there's actually not a book that tells you how to do relationships that doesn't have 
religious underpinnings. And I was like, that can't possibly be true. And then I went to the bookstore and I was like, holy shit, you guys, that's true. And then, you know, 10 years later, that is no longer true because now there were a bunch of other books. And then we had a, some, when we published Friending, there were not other books about adult friendships in print, which seemed ludicrous, but was also somehow true. So, you know, that's why those books were so successful out of the gate, you know. And then, you know, secondarily, the, the to a lesser degree, the question is, is this a genre that we are known for? Is it at least adjacent enough to successful genres that we published in that it will make sense coming from us? You know, and that's, you have to look at that from a most distanced perspective as you can. So as you can imagine, this is much simpler to assess for topics that you're familiar with or emotionally close to. So, you know, again, sometimes you have to go to the bookstore and check it out, which is, you know, not a uh, burden at all. Sometimes the topic is a bit too upper crust for us. Like, you know, we wouldn't publish a history of the British crown or something like that because our reputation is going to make people think that we're like making fun of the royals, you know, or they're going to think that there's like a sarcastic or satirical point in there just because of like all the books that we publish that are like that, you know? So, and in that way, you can't go from super sarcastic to super serious because people are not going to make that transition with you. So the way that we inject humor is going to be difficult to get away from. So when we first announced Unfuck Your Brain in 2017, Penguin UK got in touch to license it for the United Kingdom. And then I sent the book and then the editor wrote back the next day and said, oh, sorry, I didn't realize this wasn't a humor title. And that actually happened. In unrelated news, the fact that we did not license it in the UK was one of our best decisions ever because we earned 10 times as much because we are the publisher in the UK. And somebody else came back to publish it this year and I like figured out what it would cost them to do that. And they were like, they scoffed at the cost because it had gotten so high in the last six years. So there's that. To a lesser degree, we ask ourselves during acquisition, is it likely that we could sell this in audiobook? You know, like, would it translate to audiobook? Would this book sell well internationally? Would we be able to sell this as a book in translation? But the most important question is always, will this book sell more over a sustained period of five to 10 years? Or is it gonna be flat a year after it comes out or like dead in the water, even worse? And so, and there's certain genres that are like that and you come to learn it and, you know, and then, but then you'll, if you have like a seasonal book, you know, that's like about Halloween or something, then you'll sell it every Halloween, you know? And so that's like a, those are kind of a easier, it's called an annual where you, it just keeps revitalizing itself. So sometimes at the last minute, we're on the fence about a submission and we have to stop and ask ourselves, how does this book like help people? And if we can't come up with a substantive answer, then it's probably best that we pass on that book because the result will come across as similarly confusing to our audience as if we published like a history of the British crown because they're gonna struggle to be like, what are you doing here? So in cases where a book can show a distinct point of view from the author, adequate demand for that category, adequate space on the shelf for one more title, our ability to leverage our relationships, reputation and skill set, a meaningful explanation as to how the book helps people, then we publish the book. And it's kind of as easy as that, you know, and that's like, the criteria and I can norm, you know, again, in most cases I can rule things out in five seconds or to 30 seconds in that range. And normally if something is in, it's like in within 10 minutes, you know, because it's like, I can kind of do all those determinations from my knowledge rather than having to research things, which, you know, sometimes you have to do. And that's pretty fun too. Um, so utilizing this method, 97% of our books outsell the industry average, and we're able to acquire new ones every year. Most of our submissions come because of what we published this year or because of our existing reputation. And sometimes people will get it a little bit wrong or they'll think of like what we were doing 10 or 20 years ago. 
but for the most part, people are paying attention to the last two to three years. And then when authors have a good experience with a publisher, they tell their author friends, and then those people come to us, and then that's sort of the secondary chain. And then if something doesn't have the uh, significant audience, and you know, you think of this, the way I was trained to think about this is looking at it from, is there an audience of at least 5,000 people that would buy a book about this subject? Because what you run into sometimes is like there was a, a craze a few years ago where anybody that was a successful YouTuber would get a book deal. But then what publishers found out is that just because someone was very successful on YouTube does not mean that anybody wanted to buy a book from that person because those people don't read or something or like they just aren't interested in crossing mediums like that. So, you know, that is generally a good way. It's a little bit more complicated now that we sort of understand that, you know, the, the end part of that sentence really has to be 5,000 people in a community that you can reach who will buy a book about it, you know, is almost the most important part of that sentence because they're not all going to buy the book or some of them are going to, you know, borrow their friend's copy or whatever. And that's fine too. But that means that you'll be able to sell enough to sustain what you're doing, you know? And then in cases when we're like, huh, I don't really know. Like when we did the first um, feminism and horror volume, that was one where we were like, huh, I, that could kind of go either way. Like there are those people, but like, will they buy a book about it? I don't actually know. And so we did those, you know, initially any project that ends up in that sort of gray area, we try it as a zine, as a test first. And then when those, you know, and it's normally fairly apparent what stores will take and what they, and what people find sort of poisonous or like, or they're apprehensive about or whatever, you know, there's just some topics where they don't feel right for the stores to have in their stores for whatever reason you know sometimes it's topical or sometimes like you know you know like when we published unfuck your eating in a lot of cases the popular wisdom of yore was that like stores wouldn't sell a book about eating disorders because that's a topic that they don't want to remind people exist you know it's like such a negative topic or you know things like that but, you know, that book did very well, I mean, or I should say is continuing to do very well. So you have to look at it from a sort of like mixed pragmatic view that way. But and that's sort of it in a nutshell is like if you're unsure, you want to go smaller and then build your way up because building your way up always has the lowest risk. and. I want to say this is the first time that I've ever made it through an entire presentation where Ellie has not interrupted me to ask six questions, let alone one. I guess you're muted. I just, I don't know. I felt like you were answering all my questions in advance. Does anyone else have questions or stories? I do have a question, actually. Okay, what was the I book? Knew it. What was the book that, in your example of the one that we had to cancel after it was announced? Um, the um, I don't know what it was, but then I was like, no, we didn't announce that one. Right. Uh, I mean, announce in. Oh, you're you may be right. It was the well. This is recorded, so I don't want to say. Okay. It. All right. Let's not say it. Okay, yeah. but it probably was the one I was thinking of. It probably was. I mean, there's been a few, but Olivia knows which one it is. Oh yes. Um, I will slack you all about it. <laughs> Who has questions? Who has a great script for when you're approached about acquisitions? I've seen some good ones in the comments. Oh. Mm, I know it is it is fascinating that like I mean I, I it's a honest, understandable thing that you'd be like see the publisher and be like oh you're here i'm here let's have this conversation and i get it that's like really why publishers don't send editors to trade shows different for the protection of the editor i've definitely had the experience especially when i was new of kind of 
and I think I think a lot of people can relate to this where you're like I don't have a lot of power in this organization so it kind of doesn't matter like I can talk to this author as a peer and I'm not like necessarily you know you're like I'm just a peon and then the but the author sees you as like kind of the source of all power and recognizes your influence maybe more than you do yourself um yeah so I think knowing knowing your power is half the battle there Kaylin Kaylin is raising your hand, but you are muted. Okay, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, we've had this challenge for years and years and years of mountains and plains that um, the Association of Self-Published Authors also takes a table and they volunteer there. And that means that um, you, you can have a dozen per show come up and pitch the, their book to you. And so having that link on the website is huge. And um, the executive director has also talked to them and explained, look, at this show, you don't have editors. You have marketing and salespeople, and they, they can't help you. And this isn't the venue for that kind of pitching. I mean, I think something like AWP, there probably are more editors. But yeah, to Joe's point, that's why editors don't go to these shows but also um, like at microcosm editors aren't the ones doing the acquisition joe can you talk about that right right good point so first of all i will tell you the horror story that at the northwest show there is that same contingent of self-published authors but they're all kind of bandied together under somebody's rule and they are usually put next to us and then they're they have they they pay a premium to sit there and sign their book at the booth as if like that's you know something that is desired to happen there but then they almost always they they assume that we're kind of in the same boat that we are so they don't actually pitch to us which is fantastic they'll come up and be like oh you guys are trying to get a foothold in this too huh and you're like well we're kind of, we kind of got what we we're kind of a self-contained apparatus so but part of that is so we separate and this is popularized now um I, it was pretty edgy when we did it in the first place but um i want to say sarah told me that they taught her this as the best practice at oxford now but years ago you know i looked at it and i was like it doesn't make sense that editors are normally the ones that acquire a book meaning like they take on the commitment of the publisher to pay for that book while they don't understand like they don't have a background in sales almost ever so they don't really understand like how reception of a book will work and they don't understand what the reality of that commitment is like they're normally buying to taste and so they'll commit where they're like oh this is a really good book and then when they have if they even have post season review with that publisher to like look at what actually happened with that book which most publishers don't do that, you know, then they will find out that the book that they really liked didn't do very well because that wasn't researched in the proper way. So then what happens is then they're like, but the book was so good. Like, why wouldn't it take? And then, you know, you have to be like, well, the shelf is really crowded and this like, isn't something that people are looking to read and, you know, and that, really quickly led me to be like well why wouldn't you separate acquisitions from editorial because it's really two very different skill sets you know like acquisitions is an operations job where you have to look at it from like a pnl basis where you have to be like okay these books are successful and we want other books like those books and these books have been unsuccessful so maybe these ones aren't right for us and i don't know when this transition happened but like other people followed suit in doing that you know and now that apparently that is a more common practice but that is i and i would say like in the last five years that happened like the industry made that transition but to me it was just like a common sense thing where i was like why would you have that be under the same roof because editing a book is very very different than understanding the market of a book or that if there is a market for a book. 
that's the long version of that answer. Thank you. Um, I do want to say, like, I feel like Joe is a little jaded from having seen a million bad pitches, but um, not that jaded. You don't necessarily want to assume that everybody soliciting you with an un, un inappropriately pitched acquisition or project is necessarily going to be a bad project or even a bad project for us. And so, like, I do try to be kind and not not necessarily like encouraging of like, oh, that would be a great project for us. Please pitch it to us, but more like encouraging of them and like letting them know, giving them the information they need to pitch to us um, yeah. without being discouraging, I guess, maybe more to the point. And we have gotten some books that we've published and that have done very well that way. Like Sydney met Kate Weiss in an elevator and was like, you could pitch us a book about sewing. And she did, and Radical Sewing is a great book for us. So, um, you know, it's, it's it's not like you have to be kind of like this negative wall of firm boundaries rigidly against all acquisitions. Sydney, go ahead. Since we made the submissions into a Google form, that's like what I emphasize heavily is that it's a very easy to fill out Google form that tells you exactly how to make it something that we're going to be interested in how to form it so that then we can notice that it is the right thing for us and it will like walk you through how to do that and i um oftentimes will like point out other books of ours that i'm like you should look at this book because it's kind of like what we do only if it is like i i believe really strongly in like the core competency thing nowadays of like we're just not going to do well with a poetry book or a memoir because like Joe talks about, we just don't have all of the necessary like tendrils into that area. But yeah, I'm just encouraging about the Google form because I think that has made it a lot easier. I do have a question though, which is that do they need to do both the Google form and do the copy paste thing into the like submission on the FAQ site? Do you know what I'm talking about where you click the blue menu it's like a drop down and it says, I want to submit a manuscript. And then you like copy paste into there. Do they have to do both that and the Google form? No, they just have to. Well, now it should just link to the Google form. And most people do that. Like we get maybe one or two a year that use the old contact link. But because the contact link does say to submit through the form. Okay, cool. Yeah, just wanted to know because it does still like talk about doing that in the FAQ text on the website. So maybe we could like adjust the language if necessary, but I don't know. Anyway, just wanted to clear that up. And also, yeah, uh, I love getting good ideas and hearing people pitch stuff at me. Honestly, it's like does have its uh, frustrations, but mostly it makes me excited because we are about own, vo own voices and um, especially when I see people who are doing that and um, want to like spread the information that they have knowledge on, I want to be encouraging at least to see if they can like work with us. So yeah, that's my two cents. Yeah, that's great, and and it does yeah, and it is it's helpful when somebody can do it and is interested in doing it. It's just like yeah, it has to be sort of both and. That's really the thing I've run into. I, you know, I feel like I am encouraging even when maybe it's dubious that I should be encouraging somebody because they're not there yet. I haven't seen you be discouraging to potential authors, but I do hear you. I hear I hear, I hear weariness in your voice when you talk about them in cases such as this. Well, you have to do the math to be like a thousand. Well, and it's like more, actually more than a thousand a year because that's the average. So we get more than three some days. There's plenty of days where you get like 10, you know, and that's so then you have to like think through thousands of pitches and maybe tens of thousands of pitches and you get a little worn after. So, Olivia has a great point in the comments that acquisitions is largely about sales and marketing, but she does think there's a place for an editorial perspective because editors can determine are really skilled at determining if the actual content aligns with the pitch, which is, I agree, very important as an editor, um, and how realistic it will be to get the manuscript into shape within the allotted time frame. Right. Well, and normally, and 
that that's like some th those are great points but those are also things that you know we can extend the timeline if that's what's needed or we can you know look at w if the book is actually what it says it is <laughs> you know because the, that that yes that does happen quite a bit <laughs> somebody says it's one thing and it is clearly not that thing and but yeah and then in those cases where it's unclear i will share it with the editor or editors that i believe have the best understanding of that topic and or like if they like actually read that kind of book then i'll be like what do you think you know because like i think this is cool but like am i losing it we have had book we do occasionally have a book come through where like you acquire it because it checks all the boxes um and on much closer evaluation by an editor the manuscript isn't really in a condition to be functional and i think that you know sometimes we make it work with the author and sometimes we don't um but i do think that is like less of a problem than if you were like i guess letting things through that were like better written but the wrong book for us right and it's yeah it's better to kill it in post than it is to yeah you know, publish well-written books that like nobody wants to read which is i guess normally the publishing problem and Kaylin also has a good kind of script to say to potential authors that they should review our website to see if we're a good fit for them. And I, I've said that to people before and just watched their sort of, I don't know, uh, watched like thought bubbles come out of their head because it maybe hasn't occurred to them before that they also get to be choosy about the publisher and that they want to be evaluating us as well. Right. Um, I, I like to emphasize that part too, that like, I don't want to fail you and your good book idea. like. We will fail you <laughs> um and yeah encouraging them to like look into other publishers sometimes i'll recommend like chronicle or something to them even though that's like that's another thing that might be good is if we were able to kind of do our own research and have ideas although i guess we don't want to send them to a slush pile of someplace much bigger <laughs> right and that's kind of the other problem is like we're one of the few places that responds so that's the other trouble of like they really think they've got you on the hook when you write back and then so you have to like quickly detach when they're like you're someone's answering <laughs> i recommend i try to steer clear of recommending specific other publishers to pitch unless i'm like pretty sure their book would be a good fit just because you know i don't want people going to like ak press and being like microcosm sent me and then ak press was like what the heck microcosm you know, stop. Like, this yeah. is not correct this is not for us um so i try to make sure only to do that if i'm like this is actually a really cool project that i wish we could publish and we're not right for it and i'm pretty sure these ones are but i do recommend that people buy and read the a people's guide to publishing um which does have give people a lot of tools for sort of evaluating their own book and seeing what publishers are looking for um and then they buy our book which isn't a terrible thing like we can offer some part of that educational piece and not have it fall solely on us yeah and that's partly why you wrote the book so that you didn't have to like basically give everyone you met a dissertation on the topic every time they asked for advice i'm happy I'm to get out of doing consulting actually i just don't always have the time to do so but i i do generally enjoy it so what that's worth thanks for joining us once again Please send your questions to podcast at microcosmpublishing.com so we can answer them on future episodes. And please give us five stars on iTunes and everywhere else that podcasts are reviewed. You can find us on the internet at microcosm.pub. On Twitter at microcosm. On Facebook at microcosm publishing. On Instagram at microcosm underscore pub. And here in Portland, Oregon on North Williams Avenue. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful week.